I was down at the Los Angeles airport recently on my way to go to Chicago. I had arrived early and I had time on my hands so I wandered down one of the hallways and came across a machine I had never seen there before. It said your name, weight, and destination for 50 cents. I said, that's impossible. I fiddled around a little while, fuming, and then I said, I'm going to try it. It's impossible. So I put in my 50 cents, the wheel turned, the bell rang, and out came a card. It said, you are Inman Moore. You weigh 140 pounds, and you're on your way to Chicago. I said, that is impossible. No machine can do that. So, like a good American, I pulled out 50 cents more, <laughs> put it in the machine, wheel turned, the bell rang, said, you're Inman Moore. You weigh 140 pounds, you're on your way to Chicago. Well, I just couldn't believe it. In frustration, I walked up and down the hallway a while, muttering to myself. Finally, I came back, pulled another 50 cents out of my pocket, put it in the machine, wheel turned, the bell rang, and out came a car and said, you're Inman Moore. You weigh 140 pounds, and you fooled around so long you missed your flight to Chicago. <laughs> well, I'm certainly glad that I didn't miss this opportunity to speak to you this morning at First Methodist Church. There are a lot of people that I know in Pasadena, and some of them are here in this church. Uh, I serve on the board of the Ecumenical Council of Pasadena Area Congregations and Friends Indeed. And is Pam Marks here this morning? Pam and Woody Haynes serve with me on that board, and it's a pleasure. Your pastor, A.D.L. DePano, is a man of God that I admire greatly. He was our district superintendent for a number of years. He's a great friend. And when I see Allison Mark, I say if young preachers like her are coming along, we are in good hands in the Methodist Church. She is a great one. One of the closest friends I've ever had in the world, besides my wife, was David McKithen. David's dead now, but in the 60s he came from Mississippi and became an associate pastor in this church. Do any of you here this morning remember David? I see a few hands. Well, anyway, at any rate, it is a high honor and a great privilege for me to be here this morning. <clears throat> a couple of guys, Bob and Joe, were in the local neighborhood poker club. By the way, I see Steve Godhold. Steve and I are longtime Dodger buddies, <laughs> and it's good to see him. Anyway, Bob and Joe in this neighborhood poker club, they met once a month and usually played till midnight, but on this particular occasion, the, the, the game went on till four o'clock in the morning. Now you can imagine what was going to be happening in the home fires when these men snuck back into the house at four o'clock in the morning. The next day downtown, Bob and Joe met, and Bob said, how did your wife take it that you didn't get in till four o'clock in the morning? And Joe said, well, she was angry. But we talked it out, and everything's okay now. And Bob, Joe said, by the way, Bob, how did your wife take it? Bob said, man, my wife got hysterical. And Joe said, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean hysterical. She brought up things that happened 40 years ago. Well, I want to get historical this morning. We are dealing with great history as we remember again the birthday and celebration 
of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I also want us to remember that we have a great history in America. All of us here this morning love America. It's a great country. And great things have happened in our country. And one of the great things is the way we were founded. In 1776, a group of men came together, declared their independence from England, and said these historical words in their prelude. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Listen to those words again. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, didn't say women, there were no women at that conference. <laughs> all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can you imagine that? They were living in a time when it said that kings ruled by divine right. There were kingdoms all over Europe and Brit the British were a kingdom. And here they were in a land that was somewhat primitive at that time. And here they were declaring that they were free. They had liberty, that all of them were equal. A king might have his robes and sit on a, sit on a throne, but they were equal to that king in the sight of God. You can almost hear these men, for most of them were Christians, you can almost hear their, the words that they remembered from the scriptures when that psalmist said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man? For thou hast made man just a little lower than the angels. You can hear them further as they heard the words of Paul, the mighty, mighty apostle, when he said, There that all of us are equal. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And listen to those words of John when he talks about how we use that freedom and liberty when he said, when Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Love is the key. Love is the key that gets you into the kingdom of God. Love is the entrance word. By this shall you be known if you love one another. And so they gathered there that day in 1776 and they had a great vision. It was a bold vision. They didn't really understand all that that vision entailed actually. But they had the vision. Now, it was a flawed vision as, a, as far as the way they lived it out in their day. Several of those signers owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. George Washington owned slaves. He sort of inherited his slaves when he married Martha who had slaves. And to his credit, when Martha died, he freed all of his slaves. But for many years, he was a slaveholder. And they were not alone. Ten other of our early presidents owned slaves. Ten, making a total of 12 of our early leaders who were slave owners. What a... What a a tragedy in the sense of their vision. It didn't include the blacks, but they had the vision. And they were on the road. They were on the way. I don't know about you, but 
I was one of those who was enamored with a television series years ago called Star Trek. I loved it. I anticipated the weekly visits where they were all over uh, the universe. It was a great, great show. And they started each one of those programs like this. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to, go, to boldly go where no man has gone before. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Those men in 1776, where they were surrounded in the world with kingdoms and monarchs, boldly went where no man had gone before, at least in recent centuries. What a great challenge. What a challenge. But it immediately took a detour in our beloved America. For America owned slaves. By the beginning of the Civil War, there were four million slaves in America. The first ones came in 1619, but they multiplied and they bought new ones and those slaves had children and the children were automatically part of the slave holdings of their masters. What a detour. What a detour from that bold vision that says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, time marches on, and this is a wonderful thing that we need to remember about life and about America and about our world. It doesn't stand still. It continues to go, and those people who constantly today, like some of our new, our radio commentators who are constantly talking about going back to the past, that wonderful, glorious past of ours. Well, we have had some good times in the past, but are you talking about those times when the slaves were here? Are you talking about those times when the South was totally segregated? What time are you talking about? Time marches on and by the grace of God, if we're willing to have the vision of our early fathers, we do hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. But it took a terrible, tragic detour, especially in the South. We had a civil war about this thing. We went to war and over 500,000 people were killed in that war. One of the bloodiest wars in the history of civilization in a supposedly educated, competent America. This happened. Well, the Civil War was won. And, the, and finally, by might and by a lot of effort on Abraham Lincoln, the 13th Amendment was passed declaring slavery unconstitutional. But then the South did another detour. Okay, they said, you said you freed our slaves, but we're not going to give them any local freedoms. We're not going to let them vote. We're not going to let them own property usually. They're going to have to be chattels. They're going to have to work the white man's farms. We're not going to give them that kind of liberty. We're going to segregate them from our schools and our colleges and our churches and in our ordinary, everyday way of life. And for a hundred years, believe it or not, for a hundred years, we in America, in the South, and oftentimes all over America, we had segregation. It wasn't just in the South, but it was at its most egregious form in the South. Now, my wife Nellie and I, we both grew up in Mississippi. We were born in the briar patches of Mississippi. 
As children, we grew up under that society. And to our shame, as children, we didn't see anything wrong with it. We accepted it. That's just the way it was. I could walk down the street as a punk, snotty kid, and a 90-year-old black woman had to clear out all off the sidewalk so that I could go past. We didn't see anything wrong with that. That's just the way it was. And I'm ashamed of it. But I do look at many people I've talked to from the South who had exactly the same thing happen to them as children. They didn't understand that there was anything wrong with the system. It was not until I was grown in the Navy came back and had a religious experience because of a black minister's speech in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was only then that I began to see that something terribly went wrong. You don't understand, really, unless you've been in it, unless you were black, how fully that segregation was. You couldn't go to the same church. You rode in the back of the bus. You couldn't go to the same schools. You couldn't work at hardly anything except menial work for a white person. You were almost totally like what Tennessee Ernie once said, I owe my soul to the company store. They were still not legally slaves, but in a sense, they were still slaves to a terrible segregated society. Into that society, and you'll pardon me if I go into a little of my own history, into that society stepped a naive kid named Inman Moore. He graduated from a Methodist college and graduated from a Methodist seminary and he came back, Nellie, and, and, he, and he married a wonderful girl. And let me tell you, I wouldn't be here today if it were not for my wife. She has been with me all the way during our journey. We've been married now 65 years, and I wish it could be 65 more. Probably won't be, but she was there. We came into this situation as a young preacher in Mississippi and I was seeing that this was a wrong thing, this segregation. I can remember now reading Maya Angelou. How many of you read Maya Angelou? She's wonderful. Maya Angelou, I heard her at a conference once and she said, when I was a black kid in the South, so I'd go into the J.C. Penney store and they'd have a black fountain, water fountain and a white water fountain. And they'd have the signs, black or only there, they said colored. And they'd have a colored restroom and a, and a white restroom. And she said, us kids, we'd go in there and we'd see that white fountain, drinking fountain. We would say, that must be wonderful. That water must be truly great. And she said, you know what? One day when there were very few people in J.C. Penney's and nobody was around, I snuck over to that drink, white drinking fountain and I got a drink. And she said it was the most disappointing day in my life. <laughs> it was just like that black water. Anyway, what do you do as a young man in the South and you've now begun to question that segregated society he grew up in? What do you do? Well, I didn't do much, frankly, for a while. It took me a while. I could preach the greatest sermon on brotherhood you ever heard about how we should treat our black friends in Africa. But the word integration couldn't come out of my lips. It just didn't quite get there. And I went there for some years. And then I began to realize that I couldn't stay in the ministry unless I started doing something as one man about it. And I became a founding member of the Mississippi Council on Human Relations. We had a great council started in the 
late 50s. Mad Gravers was one of our finest members. Later, he was assassinated. All of us uh, had some problems about it. When we would go to meet at our council meetings, we could only meet at a little school called Togaloo, just out of Jackson. And there, meeting there, we would be met by several dozen highway patrol officers. Mississippi at that time was under the total control of the White Citizens Councils, which was a highfalutin name for the Ku Klux Klan without their robes. They controlled the state. They'd elected their own governor. Ross Barnett said segregation yesterday, segregation today, and segregation forever. And he had these highway patrolmen out there taking our names and license plate numbers and so forth. And Mississippi had formed a commission called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. And their sole purpose, using tax money, their sole purpose was to list subversives in the state, go about the state proclaiming the value of segregation and the, and the Southern way of life. Well, I got on their list real quick. And I tell you to this day, of all the lists of organizations and places that I've joined and my name appears, I'm the proudest of being on the list as a subversive of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. It's still a source of pride. Well, in late... 19, in 62, and by the way, the, the days of violence and great uh, extreme action came in the middle 50s to the middle 60s until the signing by Lyndon Johnson of the 64 Civil Rights Bill and the 65 Voting Rights Bill. Because you see, not a black in, per in Mississippi could vote. Not a, a single one. Not a one. There were almost as many blacks in Mississippi as there were whites. But not one could vote. Fact is, one of the educators, black educators in Mississippi, a, a fine man, decided to test the waters. And he went up to vote. And at that time, Mississippi had laws where you had to pay a poll tax, which was to keep most blacks away because they didn't have much money anyway and they weren't going to spend it to vote. And then they also, and this was the kicker, they had to answer a question from the county clerk. Well, in white people's case, usually they either didn't even ask the question or it was a casual question like, how are you this morning? Well, they asked this black man, said, you'll have to answer a question, how many bubbles are there in a bar of ivory soap? And he gave the correct answer. He said, the correct answer is not a, and pardon the vernacular, not a damn black in Mississippi is going to get to vote this year. And that was the correct answer. That was correct. They didn't vote. You think about that. You think about that in Mississippi. No women could vote all over the nation in the 60s, in the early 60s. No women could vote. And no black men could vote. The only voters in Mississippi from the days of the Civil War until 1920 were white males. And it was in this cauldron that in late 1962, 27 other Methodist ministers and myself met and decided we needed to do something. And so we signed a resolution called Born of Conviction. If you want to see it, it's on the internet. Now if you read it, when you go to the internet, you'll say, what was all the furor about this? Because we said basically this. We said that we are opposed to discrimination of any sort from any race, creed, or color. We said that we are opposed to using state money to open private academies to avoid integration. 
and thirdly, because the White Citizens Council had accused us all of being communist. We said we are violently opposed to communism. Well, you would think that's pretty innocuous, wouldn't you? <laughs> but, but we signed it in late 62, and in January of 63, it came out in the Mississippi Methodist Advocate, which was circulated all over the state of Mississippi. And pandemonium broke loose because immediately the Associated Press picked it up and carried it in newspapers all over America. We made headlines all over America for a time. And we particularly made headlines in all of the state papers in Mississippi. We got lots of letters from out of the state. Many of them were complimentary. <laughs> from those inside the state, they were less than complimentary. It was a very moving document. It moved most of us right out of the state. <laughs> Thirteen of us knocked on the doors of the California Conference in 1963. Thirteen of us. That's the most that have ever come outside in any one year. It's the most from one conference especially. <laughs> Bishop, Bishop Kennedy and the preachers in this conference dubbed us the Mississippi Mafia. And so it went. Well, my time is rapidly fleeting. And I have to tell you that the beat goes on. It has to go on. It has to go on. We have to continue. We're not nearly done with civil rights. Women finally won in a bloodless revolution to vote in 1920. But the road to civil rights never ends. We spend all our lives working hard to make this a better country. And it never ends. And so this morning, I close by saying again, what a bold vision they had. It has never been completely fleshed out. And you are the fleshers out. You are the ones. Not anybody else. You have to live your own life. And what you do, and what you say, and what you think, can make a difference as to whether that vision lives on today and flourishes tomorrow. Thank you, and may God bless you all.